Dave Courtney, often referred to as one of Britain's most infamous former gangsters, has lived a life that reads more like a screenplay than a biography. Born on February the 17th, 1959, in Bermondsey, London, Mr. Courtney's early life was steeped in the environment of the capital's underworld, an aspect that would define much of his existence. Mr. Courtney grew up in a London that was very different from today's metropolis. It was a city where loyalty and reputation held significant value and Mr. Courtney quickly made a name for himself. Known for his flamboyant personality, he became a well-known figure within the criminal fraternity, not just for his physical presence, but also for his sharp mind and charismatic charm. Dave Courtney's life story is punctuated with tales that blur the lines between fact and fiction. He claims to have been involved in various aspects of the criminal underworld, including acting as an enforcer, debt collector, and providing security for some of London's most notorious gangsters. His autobiography, Stop the Ride, I Want to Get Off, published in the late 1990s, offers a glimpse into his colourful and tumultuous life, detailing his experiences in the intricate workings of London's criminal underworld. One of the most intriguing aspects of Mr Courtney's life is his relationship with the media and public. He has never shied away from the spotlight. Instead, embracing it and using it to craft his image. Mr. Courtney has appeared in several documentaries, given countless interviews, and even dabbled in acting, taking on roles that often mirror his life or persona. His ability to remain a figure of fascination and controversy is testament to his complex character. He is at once a charismatic entertainer and a figure from a bygone era of London's criminal fraternity. Mr. Courtney's home, famously known as Camelot Castle, reflects his larger-than-life character, decorated with memorabilia from his life and career, including swords, armour, and photographs from famous faces. It serves as a museum of his own making, offering insight into the man behind the myth. Despite his notorious past, Dave Courtney has also been involved in various charitable activities, showing a different side to the character often portrayed in the media. He has spoken openly about the consequences of a life of crime, using his experiences to warn others against following in his footsteps. In the latter years of his life, Mr Courtney had taken on more of a reflective tone, contemplating his legacy and the paths he has chosen. His story is a complex tapestry of choices, chances and charisma, embodying the contradictions and complexities of a man who has lived on both sides of the law. Dave Courtney's life is a reminder of a London that once was, marked by its own codes, battles and legends. His story, whether viewed through the lens of admiration, scepticism or disbelief, is undeniably a fascinating chapter in the annals of British criminal history. This man is Dave Courtney. He has robbed, extorted and murdered his way to become one of the most feared and revered criminals in Britain. He is known as the Yellow Pages of the Underworld. If you need someone killed, a driver for your getaway car or a dodgy doctor to patch up a bullet wound, Dave Courtney will know someone who can help. Dave's a proper man. Be fair with him and he'll be fair with you. You try to fuck him and he'll fuck you. It's September 1999 and Courtney has brought his boys back together for one last job. If it comes off, it could make Courtney a rich man. The trouble is, the police are following his every move. <laughs> Courtney and his gang arrive at a leading bookstore on London's Oxford Street. Not to rob the place, but to publicise the launch of his autobiography. Like Ronnie Biggs, Lenny McLean and mad Frankie Fraser before him, Dave Courtney has decided to cash in on his notoriety by recounting the gory details of his terrible crimes. Everyone take a look at this, that's how you go to do it, six at a time or piss off out of it. Virgin Publishing has paid him an undisclosed amount for the book and promised Courtney his colourful history will ensure that it's a bestseller. Courtney now hopes to become Britain's most wanted celebrity gangster. Wait. He's a very, very aggressive man and very dangerous. Um, he's been linked to several murders. He's confessed to murder, um, several murders, not just in this country, but also abroad. Um, his book, even brazenly in his book, he, he decided to confess to two murders in that as well. So someone like this is um, not a nice man. And although he is, uh, at first sight, 
uh, a gentleman. You, you'll never find a more charming man, but I think that, that therein lies his uh, danger and power. That's it. Dave Courtney has assembled his gang for a photo shoot. Unlike most criminals who try to conceal their crimes, Courtney has decided to tell the whole world about his. I've done uh, what, what would be said in the Bible is the most cardinal sin and had to take someone's life on more than one occasion. But once again, I feel I was justified in that as it was sort of put upon me that it was a mere him situation. Now that doesn't happen to normal people in normal everyday life, but in very rare occasions in my way of life, then that um, does arise. There is certain problems in this life where people need a fucking good hiding, and Dave was the one that would usually give it to him. You know what I mean? He would be the chosen one. People would say, Dave, this fucker really needs a hiding. We can't talk to him, we can't deal with him. So Dave, they knew, would go and do the job. A lot of the things that he's had to give people a clump for, he has made sure that he's justified for it. He's got morals about the way he handles his life, and I respect him for that. People might look at us a lot and say they're a complete and utter rebel, but Dave can control that rebel. You know, he can pull them all together as one and control them. There are so many people out there, and if they had a whisper of anyone going to arm him, they would fucking jump to his defence. You know, he can rustle up a proper army when he wants to. What I think, my main input into the criminal world is this. I provide morale. I make the criminal game look like a, a careers option. You might expect a gangster like Dave Courtney to come from a criminal background. But on the contrary, his father was a Cub Scout leader and his mother worked as a store detective in Woolworths. His mother says she struggled with his behaviour as a boy, but that early efforts to reform him failed miserably. Oh yes, yes, you tried. Very hard you tried and you sat for hours and talked at night time. You sat and waited because you were worried, you didn't know where he was, so you sat up at 2, 3 in the morning, you come in, you talk to him for hours again to know why, what and wherefore, you just talked and you think, oh yeah. Next day, <laughs> you hadn't got through at all. <laughs> Courtney was born on the 17th of February 1959 and grew up here on the Sheffield Park Estate in South London. That's where I learned to ride a bike, that's where I learned to steal cars and it was my first experience of gang stuff, you know. Like this estate had its own gang and that estate had its own gang and then your school had its own gang and um, you know, it was my first experience of the gang thing where boys are concerned and that is very very addictive in itself because the comradeship the me and mine and us against them really appealed to me at the beginning of the 1970s a young dave courtney attended forest hill school he was considered a problem pupil but one teacher did manage to get through to him one of the teachers we had there was um john edwards i remember who who to me was just the most hip, trendy teacher you could possibly imagine. But everyone, everyone liked John Edwards. Especially the naughty kids. I don't know why. <laughs> it might not be a good advert for him, whatever he's doing now, but the naughty kids loved him. I remember Dave very well as a, a 15, 16 year old um, with, I thought, a, a talent to tell a story, um, a talent of acting. And I think if I'd chosen a life for him, it probably would have been down that road. I think he, he could and maybe still will, will be another Bob Hoskins. Um, he could have been a really good comedian, real stand-up comedian. And I suppose if I'd had a choice for him, I would have wanted him to, to pursue that career rather than going into the criminal path that, that he did. Courtney was introduced to the criminal underworld at his local boxing gym. He went into boxing, he met all these people, he saw them all having a good time, money, big cars, jewellery, and he just thought, fine, fair enough, this is what I want, and I'm going to have some. While going to these amateur gyms when I was young, I actually saw these 
elder men coming in who were legends in the criminal world was treated with such unashamedly respect and people bending over backwards for them. It didn't matter how old they were or what they looked like, they always seemed to have a pretty lady on their arm. They always had a beautiful car outside and they was dressed immaculately. And um, that burnt into my head is that is what I want to be. After Courtney left school, he sank into a life of petty crime. Before long, he was stealing cars, breaking into newsagents and hijacking lorries. As you're growing up, the messing about turns into money-making naughtiness. Right? And that's how it actually evolves. You don't think, well, I'll go out and I'll be a villain. You just go out for a laugh and all that. Right? And the thing you're doing for a laugh, you realise you could actually put to work and put into genuine money-making schemes. That's when a, a laugh becomes criminal. But Courtney was about to graduate from small-time crook to organised gangster. It all started on New Year's Eve 1979, when his younger brother was beaten up by kitchen staff in a local Chinese restaurant in a dispute over his food order. And I, with a load of my mates, ran up to the Chinese restaurant where this had took place and burst in and asked, you know, in no uncertain terms, who had just uh, attacked the 14-year-old. And they all started off and over the counter with knives and swords and sabres and all that. Saying, oh, it was me, it was me, it was me, and all that. And so I went for the guy with the big knife first. I got the skewer knife thing off of this guy. He jumps up onto the counter. And I actually said to him, now what are you going to do? You're up there. You know what I mean? You can't, what are you going to do now, you fucking idiot? And he just dived, he just dived onto me. I mean, my arm was two foot, the, the knife was two foot, so I was standing like that, and he just dived onto me. He went in and come out. And um, then it, it all sort of slipped in a turbo again, and everyone was attacking me with dinner knives. And I had to fight my way out of the restaurant. Courtney was sentenced to three and a half years for carrying an offensive weapon with intent, actual bodily harm and affray. The original charge of attempted murder was dropped at the trial. I was a very young man at the time, I was only 21, and um, it was a very enlightening experience for me. You know, a very an invaluable, invaluable experience for me to go out of prison at that early age with such a little sentence. You know, what I learned some people get a 10 year stretch to learn, you know, a little one at the beginning of your career is, is good. Courtney's stretch in prison fueled his criminal ambitions and also taught him how to realise them. When he was released 18 months later, he was determined to use his new knowledge to begin his career in organised crime. <laughs> Fucking tries are real ones. Excuse me, mate. No, no, wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. Let me do my glasses. Wait, wait, let me do my glasses. In the early 1980s, Dave Courtney began to lay the foundations for his empire. He started by working as a doorman at a number of clubs and bars in London. It wasn't long before he was being offered employment which was less than legal. If anyone wants anything done and they don't actually know an hard nut, they know the doorman down the club. And so you, it's like a job centre for people like myself, you know, there's a thousand people in that building all ready to come up and ask you, can you do this, can you do that, can you do this? So, um, uh, my criminal sort of <clears throat> field accelerated greatly when I, when I took over a load of doormen. Courtney was ambitious. Soon he was managing whole teams of doormen, and he was making the contacts that would prove to be the cornerstone of his criminal career. Nicky Goldtooth and Marcus both worked security for Dave Courtney. There's the doormen who want to just work on the door, and there's other doormen who want to actually employ people and get on a little bit further than that, and then have the team working for them. And I mean, obviously, there's a, lot, there's a fair bit of money to be made in it. If you can build the teams up and run it properly, you'll get a good reputation. If you get a good reputation, you'll get more and more places to take over. Dave, I think, took a lot of the troublesome places over when he was a lot younger. Well, a lot of other door teams didn't actually want them. So, I believe, you know, he worked quite a few rough, rough sites before he got any sort of decent club and sort of earned his reputation from working there. One of the first spin-off jobs from the door security network was debt collecting. Courtney was known as an enforcer, 
His job was to recover money from reneged deals and dodgy loans. How he recovered the money was left to his discretion. Debt collection works like this. It's very easy to justify the violence, if you use violence at all, in a debt collecting job. Because I don't feel as if I, or me or mine, are doing actually anything wrong. This person here has robbed that person there. All right? So whatever methods I use to get his money back for him, I've got my Robin Hood out on. I, I'm justified. <coughs> How you now handle debt collecting my way is the psychological approach. Right? If you approach somebody with as much dignity and respect as you possibly can, and by looking at you, he knows you don't have to do that. Right? He knows that me and the two blokes down on his doorstep could cause him the biggest problem he had had in his life and give him such severe pain that he would never ever forget it but you're actually being very nice and giving him the opportunity to rectify his mistake right and also explain to him that by doing this to you mate i'm justifying it with myself what i'm going to do to you later she knows the real day and if i have had to go and do something she knows there's a good reason for me doing it that does not that would not stop the embarrassment in me by sitting here with my mum and saying, well, mum, I've actually chopped a man's finger off with a set of rose cutters or I'm afraid there's a couple of people that have lost their life down to me and uh, and all that. I've never once in my life had to do that. She wouldn't want to know it. I wouldn't want to say it. And although she's read it in the book, she'd never asked me about it. And I've never offered uh, the explanation, but I'm sure my mum knows that I wouldn't run along and take someone's life for nothing. That's fair. Although Courtney, the enforcer, favoured the psychological approach, he was nevertheless prepared to murder people when it suited him. Seymour and Brendan are two of Courtney's oldest friends. There were certain people who were so mad and big and strong and powerful, you can't go up and have a conversation with them because they will fucking kill you. So the only way you can deal with it is kill them first. You know, you'd much rather be the one that's there the next day being interviewed about the killing than the one who's in the box. I was paid a considerable amount of money to go to another country and stand beside someone and look threatening enough and hope that he wouldn't rob us while we were doing a, um, a transaction with money. And I obviously didn't look scary enough and he did try to rob us and the person I was with was shot dead in front of me and I had a second and a half to make up my mind whether I was going to shoot him back or um, whether I was going to be the next one lying on the floor, and I made up my mind in half a second and shot him. But Courtney's cunning has always enabled him to escape conviction for murder. On one occasion, he even used a nightclub's closed-circuit cameras to provide him with an alibi. I went to a nightclub and made sure I was seen on a um, CCTV camera. I had a good chat with Dorman. I went in and made sure I was well noticed inside. My missus went onto the stage and started her act. I went out the fire exit, drove round to the man's house and shot him. Uh, came straight back to the club via the same fire exit. Carried on having a dance around, took my wife off the stage, stayed in the club an extra hour, left, said hello to the doorman, kept on the CCTV camera and went home. And when um, um, I was arrested, I produced the tape and got not guilty. Like in any job you do, you have days where it just goes wrong. And um, I have kicked many a door down and gone flying down the passage, standing on the door like a surfboard to the wrong house. I have thrown furniture through, um, furniture through front, through uh, um, glass back doors and grabbed out of a bloke on his set E. And he went, no, this is 37B, 37B, you know? I have had somebody brought to me that's had a whack round the back of the head, been tied up and he's got sellotape all around his mouth and they drove him all the way out on the motorway to me with the music blasting in the boot of the car. He thinks he's off to be killed. Uh, so by the time he gets to me, he's actually crapped his pants, wet his trousers and everything, and I open the boot to do my speech, boom, tear the thing, wrong geezer. So they just had to, like, you know, take him back. <laughs> Say sorry. <laughs> I put the quid in his pocket and say, sorry. How much money have I earned? I've earned over a million pounds. I've earned my way a million pounds.
By the mid-1990s, Dave Courtney's violent exploits were gaining him notoriety. Ian Edmondson was then a crime reporter for the News of the World. Dave Courtney uh, was the Yellow Pages of Crime. If someone wanted um, a job done, whether that be a, a massive debt recovery, um, someone shot, um, someone wounded very badly as a warning, then he would do it. He would do it for whoever asked him. He would pay the most money. He was a debt collector, he was an enforcer, but he happened to know an awful lot of other people through the, the criminal activities, bank robbers, killers, whatever, you know, whatever line of business they all knew Dave. And a lot of people ended up using Dave as a connecting point. Courtney had by now established a formidable reputation in the criminal underworld and his door security teams covered the length and breadth of Britain. They've had about 500 flat-nosed geezers working for him, you know. A proper, proper big firm. I mean, they're all his friends. And they can call them up at any time. You know, but they run all the doors, you know. That was it. They were Courtney's doors. This army of doormen didn't go unnoticed. Courtney was about to enter the Premier League of Crime. The catalyst was a phone call from deep inside Maidstone Prison. The caller was Reggie Cray. Ronnie Cray, one half of the infamous Cray twins, had died in prison. The funeral preparations were being planned and Reggie was to be allowed out for the day to pay last respects to his brother. He had particular concerns about security. I know everybody's a Cray twin fan and they thought someone might come here and try and desecrate the body and all that and so I slept in here. But on the day it was unbelievable, this was all fenced off. There was about four or five hundred um, press all round here, there was hanging off lampposts, there was up scaffolding, there was on the roofs. And it was all fenced off from there and this was just a, a mass of reefs, it was the most beautiful, the most beautiful flag you've ever seen in your life. And there was like untold television cameras everywhere and um, nearly over a quarter of a million people, the biggest funeral since Winston Churchill. And for me, it was very, very scary because I was running a security and if anything went wrong, it was falling on my head. One of the most memorable conversations I had with uh, the chief of police at the time was, um, I was being a little bit cocky, like I normally am, when I was, he was saying about what, he's, uh, what policemen could do that my security men could do, and I was saying I could do everything that a policeman could do. And he said, one thing you can't do, he said, um, we haven't ruled out the, uh, the possibility of snipers, he said, and the one thing we've got that you haven't got is we've got firearms. And I said, well, no. I said, you're wrong there, Gov. I said, because the one thing you've got that I haven't got is firearm certificates. We've got the guns, and he just didn't find that very funny at all. <laughs> well, and now this church holds 150, 200 people, and out here there was maybe a quarter of a million. Now, what, what 200 do you let in? You know, that, that is... Uh, do you let in someone that's never met him before by accident and say, all right, and then go no to someone that spent 20 years in a cell with him? Now, you've got to know who is who, and um, that was the hardest bit of the lot. I had 160 blokes on the day. Mr. Glasgow, Mr. Newcastle, Mr. Liverpool, Mr. Brighton, Mr. You know, Manchester. I, I picked the cream of the crop, but what I needed here was not really good fighters to bash someone up if they'd done something wrong. I needed people here that were scary enough looking to stop you doing it. You know, if someone was going to throw a, a stone at, at, at Reggie's car, what, what, what's going to stop him doing it? A 23-year-old ginger spotty kid in a police uniform that's going to lock him up for the night for disturbing the police and let him out in the morning? Or a 6-foot-8, 20-stone Gladswegian with a lamp in his pocket? You know what I mean? I know what would frighten me. One's going to nick you, one's going to pull your arms out of his socket and bash you around the head with it, you know? And, and, and it went off perfect. But Reggie Cray wasn't the only one to notice the formidable army of hardmen under Courtney's command. Whilst on holiday in Tenerife to celebrate the successful Cray operation, Courtney got a call telling him things weren't well back home. His door empire was systematically being shut down, his pubs were being forced to close, and one by one his nightclub contracts were being cancelled. When he returned, he realised the job that was supposed to bring him more work had brought him a lot of unwanted attention. After the Cray's funeral, um, I, like, we thought it was going to have a beneficial effect, and we thought it actually bring in more work because of the sort of status attached to it. Instead, it worked the opposite way around. Um, it became the police became overly interested in Dave, and if anything, made, it made him a target. It made him a target to shut him down. I think probably one of the main reasons is that you know, a civilian 
shouldn't have, they, they thought or felt that civilians shouldn't have that much control or that much power over such a large number of doormen. Well, actually, right, almost a, a week or two after, Dave was shut down by the police. We all lost our jobs at the uh, the Hippodrome and uh, the Aquarium and other places where our, our other pals are working because the police put the squeeze on the management and the owners to have Dave Courtney's men out the way. They want to fit him up. The Croatian funeral actually brought me into the limelight where the police are concerned and from that minute on they decided to close everything down and you cannot beat the system. I'm afraid you can't. You know, you have to sort of cut your losses and go, boom, well, I won't do that no more. You know, if I carried on being a naughty man, I would be in prison by now. By the end of 1995, Courtney needed to find a new line of work. So he decided to capitalise on his violent past and the public's appetite for true crime. He set out to remodel himself as Dave Courtney, celebrity gangster. In conclusion, Dave Courtney's life is a vivid tapestry that intertwines the grit and glamour of London's underworld with the personal evolution of a man who became as much a legend as the tales he's part of. His journey from the shadowy corners of Gangland to the public eye as an author, actor and speaker paints a complex picture of redemption, resilience and the indomitable human spirit to adapt and thrive against the backdrop of changing times. Mr Courtney's narrative offers more than just a glimpse into the criminal underbelly of London. It serves as a poignant reminder of the power of personality and the impact of one's choices and the possibility of change. His life, as controversial and debated as it may be, prompts us to reflect on the broader themes of legacy, identity and the fine line between infamy and fame. As we consider Dave Courtney's story, it invites us to question, how do we reconcile the many facets of a person's life? Can a tumultuous past be overshadowed by acts of charity and warnings against a life of crime? And in the end, what lessons can we draw from the complexities of such a life? Rest in peace to Dave Courtney. His story leaves us with much to ponder about the choices we make and the legacies we leave behind. What are your thoughts on the transformation of individuals with notorious pasts? Do you believe the capacity for change? And how should we as a society navigate the stories of those who have walked in both the shadows and the light?